Hi, I'm Scott Miller. Welcome to the bookcase. I'm Dan Lewis. Welcome, everybody. And Dan, what's your book for today? So my book for today is a book called Connect, uh, written by David Bradford and Carol Robin. And books, Scott. my particular book is The Full Facts of Cold Reading by Ian Rowland. And I suppose at first glance, Dan, it, it might be really difficult to even think about what these two books might have in common. Yeah, I have been kind of struggling with that for, for the past couple of weeks and in the end, I, I kind of think they, they come at the same issue, which is how to have good relationships, how to improve your relationships with others. And, and that's, that's the kind of the, the theme, that I, the overarching theme. And neither of these books, like most of what we've reviewed on the bookcase thus far, have really any direct connection to psychotherapy. They're, they're not written by psychotherapists. They're, they're, they're not books marketed primarily to psychotherapists. Which I, I think is a very interesting thing because that's one of the things that I do in my intellectual uh, life is to, to kind of try to bring, I don't know, books that I'm reading, even fiction that I'm reading, but certainly all of the books that I'm reading kind of bring them into what I do on a day in, day out basis. Hmm, I was just going to say that that's one of the things we talk about in Better Results, our, our last book, with regard to deliberate practice, that whether you're reading a research paper or you're reading a novel or seeing a movie, people who do effective deliberate practice are often looking for common themes in all of the activities that they engage in. Which is a, kind of really interesting because at least in the past, I've been fairly self-critical at times when I, I'd be reading a book and I would bring some material to, to a group or, or the clients I was seeing. And I, I, I don't know, somehow I felt that that was almost influencing them with my own stuff. Hmm. And, and then more recently, I thought, well, why the heck not? Because <laughs> it's just, it's, if you're bringing a variety of concepts and ideas to your clinical work, you know, what, what could be wrong with that? You know, I agree. And for us, the connection between the work of a therapist and the book, The Full Facts of Cold Reading by, by Ian Rowland, came about almost seven or eight years ago now when we as a group were trying to have an analog some other group of people who had an exceptional skill at connecting with others so that we could understand how this group of top performing therapists worked because all of the research in our profession seemed to me or struck me as very vague e even even to the point of trying to identify who were the best therapists and for for most of the history it wasn't even tied to whether or not they helped their clients rather it was tied to voting amongst the therapist about who they thought was the the the, the master therapist among them the outcomes were always sort of secondary so we reached out to a local performer and thinker here in the city of Chicago, whose primary job is to help mentalists. These are professional entertainers who give the audience the sense that they can read their mind or know more about them than they should. And one of the people that this person recommended we begin looking at and reading was in fact, Ian Rowland. So this, this entire book, and it's very detailed, lots of how to, what to do, is, is about how to speak in a way that enables the person you're speaking to to feel quickly understood and as if you have unique and special insight into how they think and feel in their lives, their history, and perhaps even their future. Right. And that's in essence, that's what we're trying to do in the therapy room, or in my case, the, the doctor room, 
is to to have the client feel like they are understood and and it 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 it's I mean you can you can watch it happen. I mean I've watched Ian Rowland kind of in action. There there's some YouTube videos out there and I mean it's it's incredibly engaging. Yeah. And and there's no way that it's not therapeutic. I realize that 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 there would need to be lots of research done in order to sort of prove that, but but it, but there's just no way it, it can't be therapeutic. Well, and and actually, just about six weeks ago, an article that we have been working on, our group has been working on for close to five years, finally was published in the Journal of Mental Health Administration and Policy, which was a survey of people who had seen a therapist or visited with a psychic tarot card reader or medium. And in fact, as, as, as you know, and as I reported a long time ago in terms of the preliminary results at the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference, in fact, people find the psychics and the mediums more helpful than therapists, which again, really made me think, uh, maybe we should be investigating what they do. It's, it's interesting that when I published a link on Facebook to the study, and my Facebook page is followed by lots of mental health professionals, the primary commentary had nothing to do with the results of the study. It was all about the methodology. Well, you know, it's just a survey and this can't possibly be true and it's all client self-report, blah, blah. I, I found it puzzling actually that not a single person said, hmm, I wonder what we might be able to learn from these people in terms of persuasive communication and connection. I did... Uh, several weeks ago, I did a brief mind reading exercise for 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 the the six clients that were in the group, where it involves some numbers and and doing some add, addition and subtraction. And for probably four out of those six clients, the the brief ten minute exercise was so engaging, hmm. and. And I mean, I, I came to believe, now there's, there's not necessarily scientific evidence of this, that, that just that exercise was engaging enough to be therapeutic that it almost didn't matter what, what the content of the rest of the group was. In fact, there was one client that for the several weeks after that, when, he, he, when, when I would come into to the facility to do my group, he was like, oh, oh, Dr. Lewis, uh, can, can you read my mind? I mean, it was just, I mean, I think it's an experience he will never forget. Well, and it, to me, it's interesting because what I heard, and I haven't heard the full uh, description of, of, of what happened, but based on what you've said, how empowering and healing it can be to feel like you are seen. Dr. Lewis, can you read my mind again? Mm -hmm. For people who are often on the margins of society, for, for people whose jobs and lives have us look beyond them, th that seems to me to be a, a very powerful element. And like you say, if you watch the videos of Ian Rowland Work or other, other psychics that work uh, very often, and our research seems to back this up, it's a, a truly healing experience on the part of the client. Absolutely. Now, is I think one thing about the full facts is that it can be pretty overwhelming. If you're not used to minding your language, that's what this book is about. And also focusing more on the immediate impact of engagement and connection with a client than fulfilling some perhaps more distant therapeutic objective or goal. I, I, I agree with you. And I've heard him talk about this. It's it's not just the words, but it's the presentation. So it's the, it's the style, it's the order that, that the, the words come in. And it's, it's a fantastic book. And I, I've read, read it cover to cover. And what really needs to happen as far as, I think, utilizing the, the content of the book is to get out and start practicing. Mm. Let's just think about one additional thought here is before we, before we move on. Very often, 
most people know enough about psychics from a television show or from watching a debunker work to to believe that they know how these principles work so for example horoscopes people say they're just so general that they would apply to anybody and at one level that's true what people seem to focus on is the generality the general nature of it rather than the client's experience of it the the point here is not to necessarily be exactly 100 percent accurate but again, to convey to the person, you see them and you get them, which by the way is why a book by William Ickes called Everyday Mind Reading, which was all about empathy and psychotherapy, was to me sort of missed the point. It was all about, could we, could we show when people were accurately empathizing? When in fact, the Ian Rowland's work shows that that's not the point. The point isn't to really know what goes on in people's mind, but for the person to experience you as connected with them and understanding them and giving them an experience. I mean, I think for the most part, people people really want to to be heard. They they really they really want to have their minds read. They 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 not only really enjoy it when it happens, but it's just something that they in, in essence crave. Hmm. And and I think. Maybe, I don't know if I'm venturing too far afield, but I think people that, that get into mental health, behavioral health, addiction type troubles are people that don't necessarily feel that kind of connection in their lives. And that sort of makes a nice uh, transition or segue to the book that you chose for this time, which yeah. was this, this book, Connect. So tell, tell us something about this, Dan. Well, so, so this, this book is, is basically written for the business world. And of course, it comes out of the Stanford Business School, which is obviously one of the, the most highly regarded business schools in, in, the, in the world. And it's, it's based on the idea, and, and I think I, I draw an analogy to, to the therapy world because we, we focus on what we know you know, facts and, and ideas about our products and don't necessarily realize that we're, we're doing business with other people. And so, and I think many of us, most of us perhaps overestimate our communication skills. And it's just not a, a, a subject that we look at very often. And so at Stanford, Years and years ago, they started a course called Interpersonal Dynamics. And in the business school? In the business school. Within the business school was called Interpersonal Dynamics. It came to be known as touchy feel, which is kind of a pejorative term, obviously. But at least it, it was a, a full course that everybody had to take. And it was based on the idea. It, it broke down some very basic communication skills that were, were useful and fruitful as far as improving relationships, developing relationships. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, because some of the examples they give, are, uh, as, you, as, you, as you hint, are that relationship challenges and difficulties, whether that's between a boss and a subordinate or between colleagues, they're going to occur in a business context. But if we overestimate our relationship abilities, if we don't understand the dynamic uh, of power in those relationships, we may be unhappy at work and less effective. Absolutely. And it, you know, yes, it's, it's kind of relationships throughout our lives, not just business, but, but family and friends. And, and there's a, and there's a, a really a series of concepts and skills and there are exercises that can be done and they're they're really not complicated they're they're very simple it's kind of your choice whether if if you if you choose to deepen your relationship with somebody then then you can if you decide you don't want to then then you but but at least it's a it's a way of of analyzing and categorizing relationships yeah and at least from their report it turns out that this is either one of or the most popular course 
in the business department at Stanford University. So clearly they are, they're filling a need here. Right. People right. say that they've returned over and over again to, to tell them that the course helped them professionally and in their personal lives. So I have to say, Dan, that when, when you suggested this book, I, I, I ordered it straight away, it came, and then I took it with me on a couple of international trips and I, I hated it. I, I just, I hated it. Uh, I, I hated the, 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 they spoke in this business language was one thing that for me was really off-putting. Everything was about risk and reward and calculating the risk and reward and the payoff. And then the second thing I couldn't stand was what seemed to me like a lot of, uh, I think my grandmother would have called it apple polishing where they were constantly talking about Stanford. It was in every other sentence and all these other big name brand universities and their many publications, et cetera, as opposed to letting the work stand on its own. I, I, I have to say, I almost gave up multiple times. And just, just so people who are listening understand, I'm really glad I finished it all the way to the end because my, my view of this really changed. Yeah, I guess while, while I noticed that, I, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't sort of foremost in my mind. Maybe, maybe I've read books before, uh, business type books before. So I, I get, and I, it, I, I hearken back to the, to the book that we talked about, I think it was last time, the Lisa Feldman Barrett book. I mean, I, I even though, the the cold hard clinical or a cold hard business opinions are maybe a little disconcerting to think about i mean i do think that's kind of how our how our mind works in essence you know, what's in this relationship for me yeah and and so i i i think just uh, and and then the the analogy as well i think to the to the therapy world where where we're so focused on our method and the the content of what we're what we're discussing with our clients rather than thinking specifically about the the relationship and 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 how to engage people in a kind of a mutual exchange that that was what really drew me and, and kept me kept me interested and i i agree completely with that after getting to the end, because the authors did a really nice job of introducing several people and then following them throughout the chapters all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. And to me, it focused on the real, the real reward for reading this was making conscious our decision about whether we continue with a relationship at a certain level or actively work at deepening that. And that is, in fact, where the risk comes in. Am I going to choose to take a risk to deepen this relationship right. uh, with this other person? And, and making me conscious of that and then seeing the multiple examples of different kinds of relationships that were portrayed in the book, by the end, I was a real fan. Yeah, and it's it's a relatively short read. It's not a it's not a complicated book. That's, that's the other thing I liked about it. It was just you know, some basic, simple concepts of being a little bit vulnerable to, 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 to encourage other person to be vulnerable. And this, this concept of, the, the, there's a beautiful concept in there. In fact, I brought that concept to the group and, 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 and they loved it. It was the, the, the idea of being over the net. Say something about that. Well, so, so there are three realities there's, uh, in any kind of interaction. So there's, there's, if I'm in, interacting with somebody, I'm aware of what's going on, my inner life regarding that, relate, that, that interaction. I'm, I'm aware, at least to some degree, of, of what you're saying back to me and what I'm saying, but I don't have any idea of your reality. Of, of what's going on in your, in your thinking. I may, I may try to, to, to think about what that is. That may or may not be your reality. But if I, 
if I basically impugn you with that reality, then I'm over the net. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm making assumptions and that's, that's not part of a, of a good relationship. Here's where I think it can connect with the full facts of cold reading. The way we speak can give people the sense that we understand them, even if we're not entirely 100% accurate. And that opens the door to a deeper connection with people, one where they feel in, engaged by us. And, and, and I agree with that. I think, I think maybe one little difference, but, but again, I, I agree with you. It, the concept is the same, is that oftentimes when we're over the net, we are ascribing negative attitudes or judgmental thoughts to other people when we really don't know that. And so I think the cold reading, a skillful cold reader will potentially inject ideas that, that, that may or may not be accurate relative to what somebody's thinking, but they, they do it in such a way that it's not, it doesn't sound judgmental. Yeah. It maintains the relationship and doesn't close the door to something deeper. So Dan, with everything we've said, what, what do you think? Should, should therapists read these books? Oh, I, I think absolutely. I mean, I think that, I mean, I, I, I guess the word that comes to mind is humility. And, and just the idea that I, 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 I'm sure that most therapists are, are pretty good communicators, but I, I'm also probably thinking that, and I know it's true with doctors, that, that that they're not as good a communi is not good as communicators as they think they are. Yeah. And so I, I certainly think both books offer some some really good ideas about how to improve communication. And, and, and let me just let me just let me just give a little plug here for 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 physicians as compared to say therapists. Our own research shows that therapists' assessments of their levels of empathic responsiveness don't correlate with measured levels of empathic responsiveness. And, and so, like you, I, I mean, I think the book Connect will, will help that, making us conscious first of, do we actually want to deepen the connection I have with this person? Yeah, I mean, just, just being aware of it is sort of, the first step to hmm. to doing something about it. And what about what about Ian Rowland's book? I think the cold reading book really it, it can be useful in in sort of opening the possibilities for what what people really want out of therapy. And and we talk all the time about client preferences and their hmm. identity preferences. And hmm. and we know that people in the world believe in psychic phenomena and mm. and whether whether we agree with it or not we 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 need to to really work with people based on their preferences it's so interesting that you say that because if you ask the average therapist do they believe in psychic phenomena some will say yes and i found also when you scratch the surface a bit many more will admit to believing that or having met with a psychic or meet routinely with a psychic than you would than you would think Still, there are many who, who see the world through an entirely secularized lens and say, absolutely not. It's, it's not real. It's not true. That's where uh, one last book I got to mention here, which is a book by Bruce Hood called The Super Sense. This is a fabulous little book you can probably get for 59 cents in the remainder bin at the, at the used bookstore. What he, he redefines this sense that there's more to the world than meets the eye as the super sense. And the example he gives right at the outset, which really grabbed me, is number one, how a guitar owned by, say, a famous person is valued at a higher value than one that was, that you've just bought off the shelf. He says, what is that? It's absolutely ludicrous if you think about it. It's absolutely illogical. Why would their own? It's not like their their molecules have rubbed off and and now you have them. It's not a magical guitar. The other thing he gives an example of is of a murder that took place in I think it is the UK. 
and how the house stood empty for years. No one would buy it. And if you think about it again, why is that? I mean, it's kind of silly. Would you wear the sweater if given a gift that had been owned by somebody who'd murdered people? Would you? Well, if you would balk a bit at that, if you don't want to live next to a graveyard, then maybe more of us have this super sense than we're willing to admit. And it's simply about embracing that with people and opening up that possibility. So I guess maybe a, a, a final, well, I don't know if it's a final comment, but but a comment is that, that and, and I heard Ian Rowland talking about this on a podcast, is that you know, I think the question was, is, is cold reading... I, I can't remember the word, is cold reading good or bad? <laughs> and basically he said, it's, it's kind of like a surgeon's knife. It can be used effectively for good, or it can be used to, to con people. And, yeah. and, and so it's, it's really kind of just a tool. And I see it as a really good tool for engagement. And I think that's as good a final word as any. Thanks for this time. Thank you, Scott.